Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and welcome, my Father, Mr. Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we bring you some of the writings of the church. Before we get to that, I want to mention that today is the feast of one of my favorite saints and one of the most important saints in the history of the church, St. Patrick. And it's not because he's Irish, because he wasn't. He was British. And he was stolen by Irish as a slave. And he had to work for them for seven years till he escaped and went back home. But during that time of being away from his family, he experienced a conversion. Now, he was raised a Christian. Uh, his father was uh, a deacon, I think his grandfather a priest. And so, you know, he grew up in a Christian home, but it didn't make much impact. Yeah, yeah, we're Catholic. It was, it was, he was a cultural Catholic. But when he was in slavery with the Irish, he was mad at the Lord to let him do this. You know, someone who doesn't believe, all of a sudden he wants God's help, right? A lot of people like that. And so uh, how come God let that happen? Well, he then began to realize what a sinner he had been. He had a deep conversion and then he had a, a, at night a dream saying that you should escape and there'll be a ship waiting for you down near where today is, is Dublin. So he went back home to uh, Britain. It wasn't England yet, by the way, because the English weren't there. They didn't come until some time, uh, 150 years later. But when he went back, he didn't want to go back to the same life. His family was wealthy. They had plantations and they were quite wealthy, but he wanted to live out his conversion, became a monk, became a priest after studying theology and went back to the Irish who had enslaved him. And this is where he becomes important. A, he evangelized them very well. But there were some Italian bishops there that uh, had come to, but they didn't work because they didn't understand the Irish and their language. He did. He knew their culture. And the Lord used his slavery to give him new insight and not only did he convert them without any real persecution, but they then said, how do we become heroic Christians? We're not, there's no persecution like the martyrs of the Mediterranean world. So then he, you know, got them started with monasticism and the Irish took to monasticism and not only prayer and very serious penance to get away from their paganism, which was a nasty form of paganism. But they also wanted to be learned. And while barbarians were destroying the Roman Empire in the West, the Irish craved the books. And the barbarians sold it to them because they didn't want books, they wanted gold. But if they could get some money for books, they did. So they, they got rid of the books. And the Irish preserved the books. Christian books and secular books, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Coptic, all these, they just they wanted to learn. And from them, when they went on as missionaries to Scotland and then to Britain, and then from Britain over to France, and then to Bobbio in Italy, and to Switzerland and other places, they brought learning with them. They preserved it because, in fact, the barbarians didn't want to invade Ireland. The Irish were crazy. They, when they went to war, they would strip naked, paint their body blue, and chase you with an axe. <laughs> Nobody wants to fight blue naked people with axes. <laughs> so, so, the, so they never got invaded by the barbarians, and they went off as missionaries. So thanks be to God for the great work. And remember, this is not a celebration of Irish nationalism. That's the way people are making it, and that's dumb. It's sinful to focus on nationalism. It's about the conversion of the Irish and how God used them to convert other barbarians. And this is the kind of good news we need to learn from. Nationalism, you just are born that way. You have nothing to do with it. But conversion is you're accepting God's grace. That is valuable. And also, it's not about drinking beer.
The Germans invented that. The Irish just took to it. All righty. Let's now take a look at uh, the Veritatis Bundle. We're going through this encyclical by St. John Paul the, the Great uh, called Veritatis Splendor, which means Splendor of Truth. You can buy a paperback copy of it from EWTN's Religious Catalog, either by going online to EWTNRC.com, or you can call them at their 800 number, 1-800-854-6317. And get a hold of this document. Or if you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Veritatis Splendor by going to our main website, ew10.com, and you'll see libraries up at the top. Click that. You'll see document library. Click that, and then type in Veritatis Splendor, and you can download it. So uh, that's, that's what you can do. Now, of course, we'd love to have you involved and participate in the show. You can do uh, a couple things. One is come here to Birmingham, Alabama, with uh, all these nice people here. We have folks from Montgomery, Alabama, uh, not long ago, ju just a week or so ago. Uh, great celebrations on in Selma and Montgomery about the uh, voters' uh, uh, rights uh, march back in 1965, it's 50 years ago. Uh, or uh, folks also coming here from the Great Republic of Texas, uh, or the Diocese of Tyler. Good to have y'all here. Or you can send us a uh, question by uh, by email by writing to threshold at ewtn.com. Now we are on paragraph 15 in this document. He begins by talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And he speaks of the Sermon on the Mount as the great Magna Carta of gospel morality. You know, the Magna Carta is um, the, the, the document that sort of set the tone for English law and structure, the relationship between kings and law, and became very important for our American forms of law, too. So uh, this is the great... Uh, statement, and he cites here St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine wrote uh, De Sermone Domini in Monte, the, concerning the Sermon on the, uh, of the Lord on the Mount. And number one, it says, if anyone will piously and soberly consider the sermon which our Lord Jesus Christ spoke on the Mount, as we read it in the Gospel according to Matthew, which is Matthew 5 through 7, I think that he will find in it, so far as regards the highest morals, a perfect standard of the Christian life. And this we do not rashly venture to promise, but gather it from the very words of the Lord himself, for the sermon itself is brought to a close at the end of chapter 7 in such a way that it is clear there are in it all the precepts which go to mold the life. So if you, you know, this is um, something I tell folks all the time. They ask me, you know, our culture is having a difficult time. This is uh, a lot of problems in our society. Do you think this is the end of the world? To which I always, and you've heard me say it many times, I always give the same answer. The angels don't even know when the end of the world. What do you think I know? Nothing. <laughs> Knowing the end of the world and being in charge of it is a management issue. And God is management. I'm in sales. <laughs> I'm here to proclaim the gospel and so are you. But, and as a matter of fact, because the angels don't know, Jesus said, you don't know, so that means it's not on the final exam. When you stand before Jesus, your judge, he's not going to say, well, did you know the day of the coming of, of Christ? <laughs> it's not going to be on the exam. But the Sermon on the Mount is, and the Ten Commandments are. That is what you ought to worry about more than the date of the Antichrist and the Christ. Oh, don't worry about when that's happening. Focus on the, the reality. 
Now, after our Lord gives his beatitudes and then speaks to the disciples saying that they are salt of the earth and the light of the world, he then goes on to give a very important principle in Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This is a very important statement, especially since as you go through the gospel, in fact, we had this reading uh, last Wednesday, you know, for the, for the uh, gospel reading. And uh, when we go through the gospel of Matthew, and the other gospels too, we see that our Lord takes a number of very radical statements. And, he's, and his radicalness is not one of rejecting the Jewish law, but of going to its core values and realities. So he will take radical positions. But for his attitude on the Sabbath, he'll ask, is it right to heal or to kill on the Sabbath? And they won't even answer. And he said, it, therefore, he heals a, a man whose arm was withered. He does what's good. And that he, he knows he's not working as such. And then they use it as an, uh, uh, an occasion to plot to kill him. So this is something where it's a, an example of his radicalness. But this, it doesn't mean that he gets rid of a day of rest in the Lord. He doesn't get rid of having a day to keep holy. We still must do that. But he wants us to make sure we go to the core of what it's about. As, he's, as he'll teach, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so this is going to be his teaching. And that's very important because there are a number of people who see the radicalness of Jesus' teaching. And then they say, okay, well, he was radical in his day. I want to be radical in mine, so I'm going to change his morality and the morality of the church to become something that it isn't. So I'm going to redefine marriage. It's no longer between a man and a woman. And then I'll be radical too. And I'm going to be radical about all kinds of other things because I'll imitate Jesus in being radical, whereas Jesus doesn't call us to abolish the law with radicalness, but to bring it to its completion and fulfillment and go to its core. That's what our Lord is saying here. It's very important to see that we use this to help guide us in the way we deal with what is right and what is wrong, especially in our own society, which is very relativistic. Remember, our, our society, you have your truth, I have mine. Last week there was a, a woman got kicked out of her gym membership because they were very committed to letting people who were uncomfortable with the gender they're born in to use the, a, any um, uh, what do you call it, uh, locker room they wanted. And there was a guy who was anatomically a man. He didn't feel like a man, but he, so he felt like a woman, so he went to the women's locker room. The women didn't feel comfortable, understandably. Understandably. It, but she was the one who lost it. So, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't just change everything around here. We have to deal with a, a lot of other values. And the value of Christ is going to be to make sure that we fulfill the law and not abolish it. Similarly, in John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. So that Christ is also going to use the scriptures to show how they are preparing for him. The prophecies about the Messiah get fulfilled by him. To, and it's one of the things we should be very attentive to throughout this time of Lent 
of preparing for the celebration of Holy Week is how even the things done by the Roman soldiers who were not saying, oh, look, this is an opportunity for us Roman soldiers to help the Jews fulfill their scriptures. So we will divide up his garments and cast lots. That's not why they, they, they did it to fulfill scripture. As a matter of fact, I'm sure they never read Psalm 22. They didn't read where it says, they have pierced my hands and feet and numbered all my bones, but they pierced his hands and feet. They didn't know Psalm 69 that says that they had given me vinegar to drink and they put gall in my, in my drink. They didn't read that, but they did it anyway, unbeknownst to them. So Christ, as he wants us to search the scriptures, and you find out in so many ways, as you read the Old Testament, that he fulfills those prophecies. This all points to a key issue, that Jesus Christ is the center of the economy of salvation. By economy of salvation, we're not talking about money and things like that. By economy, what they mean is the way that God chooses to redeem the human race. God could have done all kinds of things. He could have just had Jesus say a word, could have had Jesus just spit on the ground. He's God. He could do what he wants. But he uses this way that was prepared for for hundreds and hundreds of years prior to Jesus to fulfill those prophecies by his death and resurrection. And this is why Christ is the center of the economy of salvation. He is the recapitulation of the Old and New Testaments, of the promises of the law, and of their fulfillment in the gospel. By recapitulation, what he means is, as you go back into the Old Testament, you read, for instance, Isaiah 53, and you see that like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. And when he stands before the Sanhedrin or before Pilate, that's what he does. And that upon him were put the sins of all. And by his stripes we are healed. All, he pulls all of this together. That's what he means by recapitulation. He's pulling all of this together from the two testaments. And in that way he centers it. And Jesus is the living and eternal link between the Old and the New Covenants. See, this is one of the advantages, too, of him being God. He is the word through whom everything is created, but also the words of the prophets come through and are put so wonderfully in so many different styles and different times, and yet they keep pointing to him. He prepares the way for his coming in one particular culture. There are a lot of other cultures far more advanced than Israel. The Egyptians were very advanced. You had the Babylonians were more advanced. The Sumerians, all these cultures were very advanced, but he doesn't choose them. He prepares Abram and then his descendants puts them in a place right along the two roads that connect Asia with Africa and with Europe. And in this way, he puts Abram and his descendants in the right place to disseminate this good news when the time comes. And it goes from there all over the world. So that we see St. Paul say in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law, that everyone who has faith may be justified. Now, by end, it doesn't mean, you know, that it comes to an end, but rather it's the end in the sense that the end is the goal, Satelios, and that this sense of end is that it's the purpose you know, when 
just like somebody who makes a painting. They don't just buy brushes and paints for its own sake. It's for a goal to make a painting, finish it, and hang it up. The goal or the end of buying paints and a brush are to put a picture on the wall. So also, the purpose of the Old and New Testaments is Christ and our redemption. That's, that's the goal. That's what St. Paul is referring to. He also cites St. Ambrose, who was the bishop that baptized St. Augustine. And it's in his book, In Psalmum, and then it's CXVII, which is 118. Uh, Expositio Sermo 18. Jesus is the end, not in the sense of a deficiency that he comes to an end, but in the sense of the fullness of the law, a fullness which is achieved in Christ. Plenty today, lages in Christo est, the fullness of the law is in Christ. Since he came not to abolish the law, but to bring it to fulfillment. And in the same way that there is an Old Testament, but all truth is in the New Testament, so it is for the law. What was given through Moses is a figure of the true law. Therefore, the Mosaic law is an image of the truth. So that, you know, again, it is not enough to obey the Ten Commandments. Say, well, I obeyed the Ten Commandments and therefore that's all I need to do to be a good person, a good Christian. No, there's more. There's a lot more. Thou shalt not kill is a good start. <laughs> I'm in favor of that. Could you imagine if everybody in the culture obeyed thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery? You could walk at two in the morning in any city street anywhere knowing that you won't get mugged or raped or, or killed. That's, that's no small issue because you don't see that today. Try walking in certain neighborhoods in any of our big cities. Try it. It's dangerous. And, you know, and, and sometimes you don't have to go walking. You can just be sitting in your home. And how many times do we hear stories of stray bullets hitting children in their bed and things like that? Because there are people who say, well, the Ten Commandments don't apply to me. Oh, yes, they do. You may not like the way it's going to apply someday when you meet Jesus, but it applies to you. And you ought to get it to apply now, but that's not enough. Well, so I didn't kill anybody. Our Lord also wants us to go beyond that towards understanding uh, what good do I do for my neighbor? Not killing them is a start, but the goal is to do that which is good for the neighbor and to seek what I can for charity for them. That's another stage. And that would be the fullness of the law. So Jesus brings God's commandments to fulfillment. Particularly the commandment of love of neighbor. And he brings it to fulfillment. This is Jesus' method of fulfilling, the, bringing the commandments to fulfillment. By interiorizing their demands and by bringing out their full meaning. So making the demands of the law inside of us. For instance, Jesus quotes the commandment, thou shalt not kill. He says, you heard it was said, thou shalt not kill. I say, don't even hold a grudge. Don't even call your brother by names. This is something that's unacceptable. And he uses the word fools, but there are a lot of other names that people use too. We just had last week how those college boys were saying horribly racist things. I really commend the uh, main, the national office of their fraternity 
and their university in shutting that whole place down. You can't do that. That is also that kind of, you know, whether it be racist, whether it be for, for any other reason, you are killing the dignity of people by using such terms. You may not kill their physical body, but even in their chance, they were saying that if anybody of, uh, of a black person comes here, they're using nasty words, then we should hang them. That's the point that Jesus is making. When you use those kind of names, you have killed that person in your mind and in your heart. And you may not do some external act, but he's saying, no, you must make this interior and not just the exterior act of avoiding killing. And this is something that is very basic. Also, you bring out their full meaning. He says, for instance, you read, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say, don't even look at with somebody with lust. That's why pornography is such a sin. You are looking at people only for the sake of, of the pleasure you can get because they are no longer persons with their own dignity, but they are tools for your pleasure. And that is not the way God made people. They have an inherent dignity you may not destroy through pornography. This is something that is very important in terms of bringing out the fullness of meaning. Love of neighbor springs from a loving heart. So this is where we're at to start. It's not just an external action that you look like you're loving. Politicians can pull that off. <laughs> but the issue is to truly love from the heart. And a lot of times we can tell you know, when the people in politics really love the people or when they say, no, I get more power. You, can, you get a, a sense of that. I uh, should always be alert to that. And more importantly, we have to say, I'm not just trying to love by an external action that you give me credit for, and maybe an award, but rather my heart has to love, and pre which precisely because it loves, is ready to live out the loftiest challenges. So it, when you say, I love my wife, and in that love and in our relationship, we bring forth a child. That is one of the loftiest challenges that comes along. You know, once you have a baby, does that mean that, well, everything is easy now? No, it's a challenge, a lot of work to do. But it is a lofty challenge that flows from your love, and your love raises you to that kind of challenge. When you love learning, it's so that you can learn things for the sake of being at the service of other people. Great scientists do discoveries to help free the rest of us from diseases, come up with ways to increase food so that more people can eat, and so on. That from a loving heart, loving wisdom, loving truth, loving science, and loving people, you do what's good. And not just, well, I know I'm a scientist. Any experiment I think about I can do, including, say, kill an embryo and take its stem cells and now play with it. No, you can't kill somebody for your experiment. You have to love everybody involved. That's, that's where love uh, makes us ready to live lost these challenges. Jesus shows that the commandments must not be understood as a minimum limit. Well, you just do that and then you'll be okay. Uh, like we used to ask back in the 50s and 60s, well, how far can I go before it's a sin? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's not right. That's hypocrisy. <laughs> Rather, we see that the commandments are a path involving a moral and spiritual journey toward perfection. At the heart of it is love, as you see in Colossians 3.14 where St. Paul says, above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. All the, all the virtues are put in that. So again, as I already was preparing the way for this, the commandment you shall not murder, 
becomes a call to an attentive love, which protects and promotes the life of our neighbor. So we don't just say, I'm against abortion. We also ask, what can I do to help a woman who's in a crisis pregnancy? How can I help her after she gives birth? So this is going to be the next stage of the question. The priest of prohibiting adultery becomes an invitation to a pure way of looking at others, capable of respecting the spousal meaning of the body. And again, the, the Pope here quotes Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool shall be liable to the hell of fire. And, and he uses the word raka for fool. This is not just a regular word for fool. They have, they have a, Hebrew and Aramaic have a lot of words for fool because they were aware of the, of the refined differences and different kinds of fools. <laughs> but the word raka that you see in the gospel means that you would call somebody a fool, spit in his face, and then start a fight. Okay, so that, that's a very, it's still used, but you don't use it very often because it's really, really a, a, a very serious word. Also, uh, we see in uh, Matthew 5, 27, uh, uh, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say that whoever everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. So that Jesus himself is the living fulfillment of the law inasmuch as he himself fulfills its authentic meaning by a total gift of himself. So he doesn't just say, you people love your st uh, uh, everybody. No, first of all, he loves us. He gives himself for us. This is, and this is, which is also a model. We don't just say we ought to love each other. I have to begin with my own life so that it, the truth of my life resonates. Jesus himself becomes a living and personal law by his example, who invites people to follow him. And through the Holy Spirit, he gives the grace to share his own life and love and provides the strength to bear witness to that love in our own personal choices and our actions. That's the task for us all. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with some questions, so please stay with us. Welcome back. First of all, uh, I'd like to invite you to do what all these nice people have done by coming up from Montgomery, Alabama, which is, by the way, when you come to Birmingham, and if you have a few extra days to drive around, you got to go to Montgomery. Amen. Isn't that a pretty town? Yes. You know, it's, it's just gorgeous down there. And that's where you start to see the beginning of the Spanish moss on the trees. Yeah. That's the beginning of the... Uh, the, the line of the subtropical begins down there, so it's pretty. Uh, so come on down. Also, these folks who came all the way from Tyler, Texas, which is not quite as wet as it is over here in Alabama. <laughs> and uh, we'd love to have you come and join us, too. So if you can, contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2976. Or go to my website, EW, or not mine, but the, our website, EWTN.com, and they will give you information about scheduling the masses, programs you can be in the audience for, uh, places to stay, places to eat. I don't have to tell you all about the fried green tomatoes, but 
Uh, some of the Texans might not have had that yet. So uh, come on down and enjoy that and uh, be part of uh, you know, our, our studio audience. All right, we're going to start off with a question from our studio audience. Start off, ma'am, where are you from? Montgomery, Alabama. Good to have you here. Welcome. <laughs> or Prattville, actually. Prattville, I've yeah. That's, <laughs> that's sort of the line right there yeah. and then on down in Montgomery. <laughs> um, you had mentioned earlier about people asking you about the end times mm -hmm. and that, you know, Jesus says no one will know the day or the hour but his right. Father in heaven. Right. But he also says that we will see the signs of mm -hmm. the times, that there mm -hmm. will be signs that we can look for that will kind of indicate. Sure. So I just wondered if you would speak well, to that. Uh, sure, sure. You know, one of the things... Um, that uh, he does speak about these signs, but we have to be careful th about that because, for instance, among some of the signs are wars and rumors of wars. Well, that's been going on a lot. And, you know, sometimes people jump the gun. Um, you know, back in the 1930s, I, I, I actually heard some hymns that were written back then in some of the Pentecostal churches about how Hitler and Stalin were the Antichrist and the beast. Okay? Uh, and, you know, say, well, they were, in, in one sense, I would say Hitler and Stalin were Antichrist. Remember, 1 John says, there are many Antichrists who have gone out from among us. And that would fit them. Because Stalin had studied for the Georgian Orthodox priesthood. He was in the seminary. Khrushchev had memorized all four Gospels by heart when he was in the seminary. And uh, uh, Hitler had been raised a Catholic. Now, he rejected, he hated Catholicism, but he had been raised a Catholic. So they did come up from us, and they were anti-Christ figures, but they weren't the Antichrist. And what we then have to do is say, all right, always be alert. Always be alert about the evil. And, you know, there's an old story that a young priest was running into the Pope's office and said, Holiness, we just heard that Jesus has come back. And his act reaction is, quick, everybody, look busy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a sense of that, you know, that you know, there's a sign of, of antichrist behavior, and we must always be alert. That's what Jesus also said. Always be Gregoron. That's the word, the name Gregory comes from that. Watching, watching, and be alert to what's going on, and be about the business of faithfully proclaiming the gospel in word and deed. And then it'll go better for us at the end. All right, we have an email here from Pierre. Father Mitch, a Muslim co-worker asked last week, why we Catholics who claim to venerate Mary so much? We do not have a book about her in the Bible. He told me there is a book of Mary in the Quran. And in fact, a couple things. Mary is the only woman named in the Quran, no other woman is named. All the other women referred to are called the wife of so-and-so, the wife of Adam and his wife, Noah and his wife, uh, Ibrahim and his wife. Uh, not even Muhammad's mother is mentioned. She's not, she's not brought up, uh, but Mary is. Now, one of the things I would, you know, uh, if your Muslim co-worker is interested in this, well, because it's Surah 19, that is the Surah on Mary, okay, in the Quran. It's not a whole book, it's a, it's a chapter, it's a Surah. Um, and it's called Surah Maryam. And in there you might ask, you know, now it says that Mary is bint Imran, the daughter of Imran. And then what I would invite you to do with your friend is take a look uh, who is Imran in the Bible? Now, you'll miss it a little bit because Arabic calls, it, calls him Imran. Well, in Hebrew, he is called Amran. And you see him mentioned in Exodus 6. 
in the first verses, for six verses. And who is Amran? He is the father of Miriam and her two brothers, Moses and Aaron. And what I would ask him is, all right, the Bible mentions Amran, because the Quran says you can check the Bible to study these things. And I would suggest to him, um, here we see Amran, in Hebrew, but Imran, in, in, and he has a daughter named Miriam, who is the uh, sister of Aaron and Moses. When did Aaron and Moses live? About 1300 BC. So it's not the same Miriam. There's a bit of confusion. And I might point that out to him. Um, and in terms of our, uh, our Catholics venerate Mary so much because our Gospels tell us to. In Luke chapter 1, she is scattered throughout. There's not just one book about her. She's scattered throughout because of her role in the life of her son, Jesus Christ the Messiah. And, the, uh, and it says that all generations will call her blessed. So we do. And that's why we, uh, we take the words of Scripture and we venerate her as we should. All right, we have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? From Montgomery, Alabama. See, these folks from <laughs> Montgomery are out questioning <laughs> the Texans here. Come on, what do you have well, as a question? I teach catechesis to young children. Okay. And I liked your explanation about the end of times, mm -hmm. but how do you explain that to a young child third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Let, let, me, let me give a crack at it. This right. may be something that helps. What I like to do is to explain death in general, because that's one of the things uh, with this. Um, in the Bible, we see in uh, Jeremiah 19 and in a few passages in Isaiah that God speaks about us as his clay, and he is the potter. So he's the potter, we're the clay. Now, throughout life, we have a choice. Unlike clay, we've got a mind. And we can either let God shape us, and if he shapes us, he will make us into his image and likeness. If we let uh, if we try to shape ourselves, we'll shape ourselves into something a bit distorted. If we let everybody else in the culture shape us, they'll try to make us look like them and not God. And then, of course, you can even let the devil shape you. Now, all through life, you have the choice. Are you going to let God shape you or these other shaping taking place. But only during this life do you have that chance because the moment you die is sort of like the clay being put into a kiln. Once it's in the kiln, you cannot reshape clay. It's baked. And death is that moment in which our life gets its final shape. You can't mold it. So if at the moment of death you have let God shape you, you're in God's shape and he takes you from the kiln of death up to heaven. If you let your culture or try to do it yourself or let the devil shape you, then it's taken from the kiln and it's put where it belongs. And it's not heaven. It's down in hell. So this is the choice you have to make. And then at the end of time, all of those baked images of God, the ones that have been put in the kiln of death, he will make them come alive. So that, he, so that we're, we're, it's not quite finished. He's going to bring it to life. And you might want to take them over to Ezekiel 37 to see how you know, all the bones come together, you know, and that uh, just like an old spiritual, you know, all those bones, those bones, those 
um, and that he brings them together. So he'll bring it to life. If you are shaped by the other forces, you'll be brought to life as something ugly. That's what hell is about. Hell is for the ugly. And, you know, not ugly like some people say, oh, that guy isn't very handsome. Well, no, no, not that guy. I mean distorted ugly. Distorted into something that is not human. And, you know, this is something, uh, and again, you know, that's one of the reasons when I was a little boy, one of my favorite stories was the ugly duckling. You'd be surprised who looks good later on. <laughs> and, and that's going to be true. There'll be a lot of people that would say, oh, that person uh, had mental disabilities. They, 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 they couldn't talk like I can. They, didn't, they weren't smart like I am. And they may end up great saints because they love God. So be careful about that ugly duckling thing, <laughs> about what you call ugly and what God calls ugly. That's very important. So it's not just ugly like we think of, oh, this is not one of these people in People magazine or something. No, no, no. Matter of fact, people in People magazine might need somebody else to start shaping them. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's from Stephen. Father Mitch, I have two daughters with my wife. Ooh, that, that's, that's a man there. <laughs> He's got, and one of the great things about little girls, they just take their daddies and wrap them around the little finger. Our youngest daughter has many health problems. We can't afford any more children. Is it a mor mortal sin to get a vasectomy? Stephen, yeah, it is. It is. You know, um, there, there are a, a couple things that um, Stephen, and, and, and with health problems like that, that's, that's a serious issue. And this is where responsibility has to go on. You may use, um, you know, natural family planning. And this, you know, uh, is a better option. The, you know, one of the things that you're saying about a vasectomy to your wife is, well, I'll give you an, one part of my manliness. I'll give you an aspect, but I'm going to, you know, distort the other part of my manliness, part of my physical manhood, and I'm not going to give you all that. No, th this is why we use natural family planning. You still give the fullness of who you are as a man. And that's why also we don't uh, uh, permit the use of the birth control pill. Because that's also a woman saying, well, I, I don't want to give you all of who I am. I don't want to give you all my womanliness. And the same thing with tying tubes, things like that. That that is you know, not saying, no, um, I'll give you part of my womanliness or part of my manliness, but not all of it. I'm, I'm, I'm holding back. Whereas marriage is about complete self-giving. And there might be times in which you have to refrain. And this can, you can learn about that. But the, using a vasectomy is not the way to go. And, you know, Stephen, I don't know how old you and your wife are, but something I've heard from my parents and I've heard from lots of couples over the years is that they have no idea. My mother said this, I have no idea how we always fed you because it was tough. And yet, and, and she said, I regret I didn't have more. I could have had more of your kids, and I didn't. And I didn't realize what it would be like down the road. But we always ate. We didn't have fashion clothes, but we had clothes. Yeah, we, we did a lot of shopping at rummage sales. You know, but uh, so what? You know, it's more important to have the, ch the person of your children than it is to have them dressed like they belong to you know, somebody with brand names. It's not as important. Oh, they won't feel good about themselves. If you love them, they'll feel just fine about themselves. You don't have to worry about the clothes they wear. The clothes they wear don't make them who they are. Your commitment to them does. And your cherishing of them. And so there may be times where it does become possible to um, have more children, but certainly the way to, uh, 
to refrain from that is not by vasectomy. That's not uh, a possibility. Another email from Alex in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Father Mitch, I love your program. One doubt that has invaded my thoughts is regarding the forgiveness of sins. If a man commits thousands of the most terrible sins during his entire life and moments before dying confesses to a priest and receives the sacrament of reconciliation, he will go to heaven. If another man lives like a saint, never committing any sin, following the commandments and teachings of the Holy Catholic Church, and moments before dying commits a sin, he will go to hell. Isn't that unfair? Alex, I'm going to ask you to read Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33. Because in those two chapters, exactly that is what is said. The, the argument that the Lord God gives and reveals to Ezekiel is really what I was saying before about the clay. Are you God's clay at the moment of death before you're put into the kiln? Or are you clay for somebody else? Have you given your life to be fashioned by someone who is not God, either yourself, your culture, or the devil? Or do you give yourself to life? It's not a balances. That image of the balances and blind justice is important for human law courts because everybody should get equal justice from the law. But that is not the principle when it comes to God because it's not about mere justice. It's about a relationship with God. And if you cut off a relationship, another example would be if you're talking on the phone and say, I don't want to ever talk to you again and click. Well, you've cut off the relationship. And then if you die at that moment, you can't say, oh, I'm sorry. It's done. That's why it's not unfair. It's rather why we are called to always be faithful in our relationship with God. You always maintain it. And that's what's key about this. It's not just about blind justice and balancing things off. That was the Egyptian model. It's the Greco-Roman model. Ours is about the interpersonal relationship where we are giving ourselves to God or not. Then we have one here um, from Pamela. Father Paco, I noticed that one of the Gospels proclaimed this year during the Advent Christmas season read, Joseph did not have relations with Mary until the child Jesus had been born, which is not consistent with Mary's perpetual virginity as taught in the Catholic Church. The word until changes the meaning completely to the Protestant teaching. As lifelong Catholics, I found this change in translation confusing. Please clarify, Pamela. Well, actually, um, notice something. When you say the word until, does that mean, does it say in the text, then after the birth, he had relations with her? doesn't say that. What is the purpose of saying he did not have relations with her until the child was born? To show that the child is not his. He had nothing to do with the conception of the child Jesus. He had no part in it. And it's, not, it's saying that he, I, I didn't touch her at, at, at all. And, but it doesn't say then that after the birth I did have relations. There's a couple other uses of the same word until, the same Greek word until uh, later on in the gospel that, um, you know, also have the same sense that up until that point it doesn't apply. It doesn't say that it starts after that, like in one of them about the uh, chapter 13 on the kingdom of God. It uses the word until, but it doesn't mean that therefore you start doing it after the end of the world. No. Uh, it's, it's just up to that point, that's the way it is. So it's not that much a problem. All right, but I do have a problem. We've run out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by his peace, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the intercession of the great St. Patrick, make you a wonderful evangelizer in our world. Also, we want to... Uh, remind you that this network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. 
and we will be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you and God bless.